Thank you. Um, so Ionic's um, strategy is the development of um, magnet and heavy rare earth supply chain into Western markets. When we look at the current supply chain for the development of magnet rare earths, um, obviously it's well publicised the complete dominance that China has in the downstream processing. Um, you know, mining of, of rare earths is, a, you know, it's becoming a very, very interesting topic on, on a global supply chain um, and the ability to facilitate the move towards EVs and offshore wind. Um, when we look at the advantages and, and the, the unique opportunity that is ionic rare earths, being an ionic adsorption clay, we are a magnet and heavy rare earth dominant product. Um, we have a product that is similar to the ionic adsorption clays of southern China and Myanmar, which has provided the Chinese with a strategic advantage. Um, and so there's tremendous upside for ionic in moving downstream in participation of the, the downstream value add on um, rare earth processing to metals, magnets, and ultimately um, the value added components. When we look at the value of the rare earth industry globally, it's around about 10 to 15 billion per annum um, as rare earth oxides, but it enables somewhere between 10 and $15 trillion worth of industry. So there's a substantial uplift in the value of the products developed um, and they need rare earths. Um, the two biggest areas of focus for us is obviously um, the EV sector, which is forecast to have substantial growth by the end of the decade, um, looking at you know, anywhere up to sort of an eightfold increase in the amount of magnet rare earths that will be required to facilitate all of these EVs um, that the world is projecting to produce by the end of the decade. And that's gonna be mirrored um, by the demand for offshore wind. Um, so offshore wind, again, using the full spectrum of magnet rare earths. So it's much more than just the story of NDPR. Um, what the market is starting to understand is the requirement for dysprosium and terbium. Dysprosium and terbium come from ionic adsorption clays. This is where the advantage for ionic and the differentiation comes into play. So looking at the rare earth supply chain, um, it starts obviously with our asset in Uganda. We've got a very large ionic adsorption clay, um, a unique asset in that it um, stretches across about 37 kilometres long, end to end, very shallow deposit, so three metres of cover, and then the clay zone of anywhere from sort of five to 30 metres thick. So very simple, low capital mining and processing via a heap leach, producing a mixed rare earth carbonate with no radionuclides. So it is a unique opportunity for the, for the sector. Um, on the back of that product, we are looking at developing our own refinery. Um, at the moment, we're completing a scoping study on, on going downstream, um, doing a location analysis to understand where the best location, where the best jurisdiction potentially is, but obviously using that location analysis to work with potential strategic partners on where we would locate a refinery. Um, and beyond the refinery and the separation of rare earth oxides, um, the potential to develop magnets, alloys, and ultimate, sorry, metals, alloys, and ultimately magnets. Um, beyond that, and becoming more vertically integrated in these new supply chains, we have recently acquired a, a company out of the UK um, with the ability to separate rare earths, but also to refine magnets, uh, sorry, to recycle magnets separating and refining the rare earth content within the magnets hydrometallurgically back to the pure oxide form so that we can now go and make brand new high intensity magnets for high end applications in EVs and offshore wind. So it's a first mover advantage. Um, it's, a, it's a new technology. Um, we're working on demonstration plant, um, ideally later this year, early next year and the ability to then move quite quickly in, in modular rollout of, of recycling globally. Um, and it's all part of that strategy of becoming more um, vertically integrated um, and um, playing a role in the, the circular economy of rare earths and life cycle ownership of rare earths long term. Um, our basket, so 73% is the, the content of magnet and heavy rare earths. Um, when we look at the magnet rare earth fraction itself, um, it's about 43%. When 
breaking that down further and the, the rare earth magnets or the magnets that go into the EVs, it's about 33% of our basket. So ND, PR, but also DYTB. Um, and that's important because it's almost in the perfect ratio for the development of um, magnets. Um, and so on the back of that, we've had tremendous interest and engagement from a number of groups globally. Um, and we have a substantial amount of heavy rare earth. So beyond the, the magnet fraction, we've got another 40% of, of rare, have heavy rare earths. Um, so the opportunity for Ionic to play a significant role in helping Western governments develop heavy rare earth stockpiles is, is a significant opportunity for us and one that, again, we're, we're engaging with a number of governments on. Um, beyond that, the resource is the second largest scandium resource globally, and so we'll continue, continue to explore the opportunity to play a role in, in developing that scandium market. Just having a look at a corporate snapshot, um, so back at the start of May, we um, had a market cap of around about 290 million, um, 31 million in the bank. Uh, we did a recent uh, raise in, um, in April where we raised 30 million and uh, that 30 million will be enough to see us through to FID on the Makutu project, which we expect will be early next year. So having a look at Makutu in a little bit more detail, um, we just recently announced a significant resource update. Um, it was a 500% increase in the indicated resource base, which is now going to flow directly into the feasibility study at Makutu, which we're aiming to complete later this year. Um, we own 51% of Makutu, we earn up to 60% on the completion of the feasibility study, and we have a preemptive right on the remaining 40% of the project. Um, as a basket, we've, you know, it's a very unique basket. It's a high value basket, um, direct exposure to magnet and heavy rare earths. That is why we've had tremendous engagement from global groups looking at getting access to our basket. Um, and for anybody looking at developing heavy rare earth refining capacity, they really need to get a product um, from us. Um, and beyond that, we've got substantial exploration potential out to the east um, and all of the infrastructures available at Makutu as well. So we've got access to about 800 megawatts of near um, project uh, low cost hydroelectric power. Um, we've got roads and rail and, um, and mobile phone communications across site. The resource that we recently updated, um, so we've, that, that resource covers 26 kilometres of the 37 kilometre mineralisation trend. Um, we've just also announced an updated exploration target, which has indicated the potential for the project to double beyond that is, uh, uh, further. Um, and so we, we've got a lot of confidence that this will be a 50 plus year asset producing magnet and heavy rare earths in an environment where these materials will be increasingly more difficult to source and being one of only two ionic adsorption clays globally that's not controlled by Chinese um, ownership. Um, you know, we're in a unique, unique position to take advantage of Western requirement for, you know, these new supply chains to be developed. When looking at going downstream and sort of mapping out the landscape of, of rare earth refining capacity globally, obviously we see that the Chinese completely dominate the heavy rare earth space so we're looking at developing our own facility to be able to market the product into North America and Europe. Um, so we're working through that location analysis now and we'll have a scoping study out to the market uh, by the end of the third quarter this year. So the value proposition for Ionic, um, you know, we've got a tremendous asset at Makutu. It's a large um, multi-decade ionic adsorption clay project producing magnet and heavy rare earths in an environment where these materials are going to be increasingly more difficult to source. Low capital, modular development that can be responsive to the demands of potentially an EV partner. Um, so we are working through the feasibility study now, planning on having the mining licence application submitted later this year um, and, and producing asset by 2024. Um, beyond that, we're looking at a path to becoming vertically integrated um, and looking at going downstream in supply chain and, um, and also adding the magnet recycling capability, which has the potential to be up to 20 to 25% of the magnet rare earth supply chain by the end of this decade. So, um, look, thank you for your time. And uh, we're at booth B1, um, so uh, happy to answer any questions uh, over the next two days. Thank you.